From what I gather, a lot of people showed up here last week, and I've gotten a few emails with questions, and all the answers to the questions have been on the homepage of the course. So I would suggest that you uh, look at the homepage every now and then to find information. Uh, because I'm going to put, post some messages and so on. And there's, a, there's an RSS feed, so if you want to stay up to date, that's the easiest way of getting the updates automatically without going to the web page every day. Um, also, I'd like to make a few comments on the midterm project. Uh, first of all, I forgot to say that when you're using the login servers, uh, you should use the word nice before your command. So if you're in the terminal, you write the following. Hello.py is some uh, Python script which does something trivial. If you write nice first, it's, if, if there's an infinite loop or something like that, it, it, uh, or it's a long calculation, it gives um, more resources to other programs in the sense that it uses the maximum po possible resources if available, but it doesn't use the resources when someone is trying to do something interactively like you typing or stuff like that, so you don't lock up the computers. So it's, it's a good thing if you use nice for heavy calculations. Also, if you have a Linux or a Mac computer yourself, this will make your uh, computer responsive even while running a simulation. And this is another advantage of not using Windows. Uh, there's also four Linux computers in, uh, in D3 in uh, Realfags Bygge, if, if, you want to, uh, if you want to use a Linux computer which I think is more convenient um, in the, it's, it's in the, you know the computer room in D3? You know where it is? Well, it's on the third floor in the Realfagsbygge, in the, in the D block. Um, also, I, uh, I found a, a, a web page which is uh, sort of fun to play with. There, it's a ton of little algorithmic puzzles which you can solve using any programming language. So if you want to get to know your programming language before uh, starting with, um, well, with a project, you can go here. It's projecteuler.net, and here there's a lot of tasks. The simplest one are really simple, but you can use them as sort of a, a tool to get started programming. The first problem I solved in one line of Python code. So. Uh, if you want a challenge, you can try to do that. It's, it's not too hard, actually. Um, OK, so I was wondering if there were any, any questions or comments on the midterm project last week. Nothing? When you ask the symbol once, uh, the equations, do you want us to hit the row so that the equation, so that the total charge is set to 1? A convenient number, yeah. And also in the in the second problem, there's uh, something like this, C, J. There's a C somewhere, right, a constant. You, ne you need to choose some numbers and then normalize it. So in essence, it is to s the point is to I make the integral of the charge distribution and be able to normalize it. That's the most important thing. Because in the end, you're just going to end up choosing the numbers. But uh, so that you can choose it as you want, so that if you, if you want to set the total charge to a fixed number, let's say five coulomb. You can do that, so you find out how to do that. So you're not just picking some numbers and you're not sure what you're getting out. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Right, so today's topics is uh, magnetostatics. And uh, if we have time, we'll go, go, go on to the, um, to the vector, magnetic vector potential, which is, of course, uh, used in magnetostatics the same way the scalar potential is used in electrostatics. OK, so uh, you know that electrostatics that's, uh, well, the typical setup is you have um, charges that don't depend on time, and you don't have any currents. So you end up with, well, steady currents, no, st stationary charges. And uh, constant electric fields.
So if there's, in general, there's a time dependence, right, on the electric field. But in uh, electrostatics, we just work with a spatial dependence. In magnetostatics, same thing, of course. But now we're working with static currents instead. And we set the charges equal to zero. This, of course, means there's no electric field. Um, yeah. So now, instead, we get a constant time invariant magnetic field. So we just look at the spatial dependence on on the magnetic field. Um, this might look a bit weird to you because, of course, when there's a current, there's some sort of time dependence. Charges are moving around. But you just say that the currents are constant in time so that if I look at the ampermeter now and in 15 minutes, it's going to show the same thing. And this is also a good approximation sometimes. For example, if you have a, uh, a high current power line, for example, it, uh, the fluctuations are only 50 hertz. That's quite slow compared to the speed of light, of course, because you could go I know we could probably cross, let's say, Europe in that amount of time at the speed of light. Um, so, uh, magnetostatics was, in some sense, discovered by Ørsted, which um, which was a Danish physicist. In 1820, on his way to a lecture, he had some sort of experimental setup with wires running currents from a battery. And he, I don't know, he, he left a compass close to the wires and it, it didn't quite show north anymore. So he started playing with it and hey, it points at the wire. What he discovered was that around a wire with a current I, well then the compass needle sort of changes directions uh, as you have it close to the wire. So in fact, he found that there are some sort of magnetic field lines which the compass aligns aligns to, which run as a circle around the, around the wire. And this was much, uh, this was a surprise to him because at the time the electric and magnetic uh, phenomena were considered to be separate, as you would think that electric phenomena and gravitation are two completely different things. It was common to believe in this time that electric and magnetic phenomena were completely different. Of course, he showed that they're one and the same thing, which you all probably know. Um, Okay, I was planning on, should have left some more space. So, another important discovery was the following, made by Biot and Savard, two French physicists in 1820. So this was a hot topic in the 1820s, I guess. Um, they did the following. Just show it schematically. They, uh, they hung two wires like this. And then they, uh, they put a current through them. And well, when you hang two wires like that and you put a current through them, they start uh, to move towards each other because of the magnetic attraction. And this is, uh, of course, uh, more, and well, they did experiments to quantify this, and uh, we'll get to that today, I hope. It's called the Bios of our law, which tells you exactly how, how much force do you get out of uh, amount, an amount of current, or how much uh, magnetic field do you get out. And this is similar to the Coulomb experiments in electrostatics, right? When you have a certain charge and uh, you get a certain force between two point charges. Um, I actually heard a friend of mine told me uh, last week that this actually happens if you have a uh, an electric forklift, and then you place the well, you place the forklift somewhere, and you have a charger, and it, uh, the voltage in the batteries isn't so large. So, but the, this means that the charging current is is quite large, like uh, several tens of amperes. And then, if you hang the wires like this, you turn on the charger, and they whoop, pull together just like that. So, if you have a spare time job in uh, with using forklifts, you might run into this. Um, all right. Now, of course, what are, you're all wondering what the fundamental equations are, because that's what a physicist asks. What, what are the equations for this system? And uh, the easiest way of finding out what the equations for something is in electromagnetics is to start with the Maxwell equations.
here the, the B and the H fields are two fields that we'll, we'll discuss them more when you get to materials, well, magnetic fields in materials, but they play much the same role as the E and D field, right? One is more convenient in some cases, the other in other cases. Um, now we're interested in uh, magnetostatics. Statics, well, that's no time dependence. So I'll take away this term, and I'll take away this term. I'm not going to have any charges, and then there's not going to be any D field. So this whole equation is gone. This is just cross product of E, and now cross E is zero. Easiest solution, E is equal to zero as well. Then we're just left with the following two equations. This is the Gauss law of magnetostatics. It essentially says that there's no magnetic charge uh, in all the physics experiments and all the astrophysics and whatever uh, experiment or observation that has been done about nature, there's never been seen a magnetic charge or a magnetic monopole, if you want. That's, that's the um, cause of this term. If someone ever finds one, then, you, then let someone know because you've got the Nobel Prize in your hands. And also that you need to add an extra term, which will make this course even harder for future students. Um, and then there's the other equation. And this is known as Ampere's law. It couples the age field to any currents you have running around in your lab or wherever. Um, let's see. And I'm going to write down the naming convention, which I'm going to try to follow. Uh, but I, I'm going to warn you that there are several naming conventions in, uh, in, uh, in the magnetic fields. But don't worry too much, because after all, the, the equations are the same. So if, even if, I, if I'm sloppy with the naming, then I'm, the equations are hopefully going to be right. We're going to call H the magnetic field. And we're going to call B the uh, magnetic flux density. And the J is the current density. It's the amount of current you have in a given volume. <coughs> there you go. And uh, we're following this convention because we follow the lecture notes from last year. And also because frequently uh, age is the more convenient uh, quantity to look at. For example, as we can see here, if you write the Ampere law in this form, it's, um, you see that the only thing that matters is it's the current. These are, um, if, you, if you write this in terms of the B field, you get uh, mu's and epsilons and stuff everywhere. So in fact, uh, the age field is usually the more convenient thing to look at in experiments and uh, also in theory, often. Let's see, um, about the current. Just so you get to know this a bit more, I'm going to draw a figure to explain what that is. Let's say you got an electric conductor like this. Then uh, there's a current flowing through it if you put a battery at each end, for example. If I put an area here, if I sort of look at the cross section of some form which cuts across the whole conductor, then uh, I can write down the following relation between the current density and the total current uh, inside the wire, which you can measure with an ampere meter, say. Um, so it's like this. So the total current I inside is equal to the surface integral. Well, let's see. It's not a closed surface. Um, if you take this cross-section surface, you integrate the current density across it, 
you get a total current. So it's, um, it's a vector field, like uh, for example the wind is a vector field of, uh, of air molecules moving around. It's a vector field of, let's say, electrons or other charge carriers moving around. And um, it's, it's a quantity per volume uh, in a sense, but uh, it has units of um, current per area. Because as you can see, this is, I mean, it has to be like this, right? If you take the total current flowing through the whole area, then I must get the current I'm measuring on the ampere meter. Otherwise, there's some current missing and that we can't have that now, can we? Um, right. And um, from this, you could also find the continuity equation for magnetostatics. Let's see. Let's look at the continuity equation. The way to get this equation is to look at a small test volume and integrate, as always. I'm going to look at a small box just to make it easy, but it could be anything. Let's say that the surface normal Differential is ds, and there's, I'm going to call the volume v and the surface dv, much as we did with the Laplace equation, for example. Now, if I integrate uh, the current flowing out through this surface, that should look like this. It's a small surface uh, element multiplied by the current density. And this should be, of course, equal to the uh, charge disappearing from this volume, right? If, uh, because charge is conserved, then if ch some charge is flowing out, there must be a, a time derivative of the total charge inside. So it's a minus sign because there's something disappearing. I consider uh, the current flowing out a positive quantity, right? Uh, So I'll just integrate the, um, the charge density inside. If it varies with time, uh, well then it, the current must uh, flow somewhere, right? Because charge is conserved. Now I can, I can rewrite the, the left-hand side by using the Gauss law, which we all know, to be over the divergence of the current. As you can see now, because the, um, I would like to get this inside the integral sign, because if I can, if I do that, then the integrands, because I didn't specify really the volume, then the integrands must be equal, right? Like this. And now, because I, I didn't really specify the volume, the integrals have to be the same, so I end up with the so-called continuity equation for charges. So the divergence of the current, the source of current, is time dependence in the charge distribution. This is probably somewhat intuitive. Um, okay, so we had the we have the two equations, which were the Ampere law and the Gauss law for magnetic charges. And now we also have another uh, criterion on our system and, uh, for magnetostatic purposes. And that's, of course, that there's no divergence in the, in the current. Because in magnetostatics, there's no charges and no time dependence. And here we have both. So it should be really, really zero. So there you go. Okay, um, alternatively you can actually 
show this by uh, using Maxwell equations and then using this as a proof of current conservation in the... Uh, so I, I think we have time to do that, so I, I'll just do it. You can remember this now, right? Okay. Um, first of all, we start out with the Maxwell equation containing charge terms. Uh, sorry, source terms. Now, if I take the gradient of this equation, I could insert this one. So I'll just jump to that. And the divergence or gradient is zero. So this term is going to be zero. So the divergence of D, I just insert rho. There you go. I have the, uh, the continuity equation. It pops right out of Maxwell equations. You can actually use this as an argument because, um, well, to show that charge is conserved in the Maxwell equations. Because I had to assume that to, to come here in the previous um, derivation. Now, I, I'd like to note that this is not really any proof that there's charge conservation in nature because, as you all know, Maxwell no, sorry, the Schrodinger equation has mass conservation in quantum mechanics. Of course, we all know that with, for example, antiparticles, this is not true. You can have two anti a particle and an antiparticle, which can annihilate. And afterwards, there's just, let's say, gamma radiation. There's no mass. So mass is not really conserved. This just shows that in the classical electromagnetic theory, there is no uh, disappearance of charge. The charge is always conserved. Uh, as, it, uh, as it turns out, we haven't seen, uh, well, I think the conservation law holds for all uh, strange particle interactions as well. So, But you can't really take this as a proof because we know that Maxwell equations are just an, an approximation to what's really going on. Right. Next subject is magnetic forces. How do, how do we get a force out of the magnetic fields, so to speak? Now we can just start out by looking at the Lorentz force, which you all know. If there's an electric field, you just multiply by the, by the charge, you get the force. If there's a magnetic field, you cross the, um, the speed, the velocity of the charged particle moving in the magnetic field with the magnetic field and the amount of charge and you get the force out. Of course, what we're interested in now is what happens without this term. So the first thing, I, thing I'm going to show is that magnetic forces are really lazy. They do no work. And you can just show this by calculating the force on any trajectory of a charged particle in a magnetic field. So the work is equal to this integral. I'm integrating over some curve C, a small line element times, times the force like this. I'll of course insert this thing here into the force. And uh, the V connects to the, this one, right? So it's just dt V cross B like this because uh, uh, v times dt is equal to dr, right? And, uh, well, there's a q somewhere. Now, let's see. I'm too, going too fast. This is the force, right? And, of course, I need a v here separately for this one. So the small line element is the speed times the small time, time step. 
and I multiply by the force. And now you can see that because of the cross product, the V is always uh, perpendicular to the force. And then when they're perpendicular, there's no work because of the, of the dot product there. So if there is, um, if it seems like magnetic forces are doing work, let's say you're, you're playing with your uh, permanent magnets, for example, putting them on the fridge, taking them off, there's of course work being done, but there's an electric field doing something somewhere or some other uh, agent of force, which, which might not be easy to find, but it's, it's there for sure. Okay, um, yeah, so um, moving on to if you have a current distribution inside a magnetic field. For example, if, I, um, if I'm a mad scientist, I want a huge magnet in my, in my house. I build a huge electromagnet and then I put, let's say, a small loop of current and what I'm interested in seeing what happens to this small loop of current inside the huge magnetic field. And then, well, I'm going to do that as soon as I get some more space. Right, so what's the force? We usually end up by integrating, so I'm just going to jump at the small force element. And then there's going to be a small, um, let's say, I'm going to split up the charge density into a small, into, a, let's see, the local charge distribution. Uh, for example, if this is in a material, then I look at the nuclei of the atoms as fixed, and then the, it's the charge uh, density of the electrons that's moving around. And then, this is a small um, triangle, right? DQ, so to speak. But instead, I'm going to look at this in the following way. That the charge times the velocity field is the current density. So if I take a lump of charge and I move it around, well then the amount of charge times the velocity is going to give me the current. This makes sense, right? And I cross the velocity by the B field just as in the Lorentz force law. Now I can integrate this thing and I, I got the, uh, I've got the force acting on my uh, current distribution here. So the total force, is the integral of all these small forces. Starting out by the volume element. And um, let's see, I could write this as, as the current distribution, the current density per volume. And I have to cross this by the B field. And there you go. So if you have now a current distribution, let's say a loop of current or uh, whatever current distribution really, you just insert it into the integral and you see what force did I get from my magnetic field. And a common example is, um, well, let's say if I have a, a thin electric cable running vertically along the set axis and there's some magnetic field. Let's see. What am I doing here? Um, right. I put a conductor along the set axis like this. It has a current I flowing through it. Uh, and there's a magnetic field coming in. What's the force on it? And I can write the, the current distribution in the following way. It's flowing in the set direction. 
uh, unit vector set hat. I use a delta function in the x and y because the, the wire is really quite thin compared to the dimensions of anything else I'm, I'm putting in the lab, let's say. So I'm just shrinking this to a delta function. So this is how you get line currents into the formulas. And I put a constant, which is the total current flowing through the, the wire. Now what's the force? Well, we got the formula right here. Like this. Now if I write this as dx dy dz, then two of these integrals, they just give essentially one, right? I just multiply by one because of the delta functions. And I'm left with the integral over z. Like this, I just cross the set direction with the B field because that's where the current is flowing. And, uh, and there you have the answer really. You just integrate over as long as the wire is and there's the answer. The general result is like this, which is just what you might imagine. It's just the line element cross product with the, with the B field local to that to that uh, line element of, uh, of wire. This is, of course, is assuming that the, the wire is really quite uh, small. The diameter is negligible. Now, uh, as soon as I get this place cleaned up a bit, we're going to look at, well, how did the B field get there in the first place? So if I place some um, current around in space, what's the B field resulting from that current? And then we got all the uh, all the quantities we need to calculate forces and magnetic fields from uh, from the currents we uh, from the currents we create somehow. Right. I just want to remind you about one thing, and that's that this is, uh, well, it's more or less like the Coulomb law. There was some scientists playing around in a lab which experimentally determined what's the um, distance dependence of uh, forces between conductors. So it's, uh, it's an experimental, uh, yeah, well, it's an experience from the real world that led to this, uh, to this law. It's an empirical law. And you could, in a sense, show the Maxwell equations from this law. Uh, often we will postulate the Maxwell equations in the beginning instead, because that's more convenient. But this is where it historically came from, the magnetic fields and uh, yeah, magnetic interactions between currents. Uh, right. In the general form, it looks like this. There are some constants of 4 pi, as always. I have my current distribution. 
I cross it with a distance vector between the distance vector between two points. I'm going to draw a figure afterwards. Let's see. Over the distance square. So this looks a bit like. Um, let's see. This is the magnetic analog of uh, the electrostatic field from uh, the charge distribution. Let's see. I'm just going to put it over here so you can compare. There you go. As you can see, we just sum up the contribution from all the charges that are uh, lying around. It's a bit more complicated here because we need this cross product. The, you remember from the long thin wire that the magnetic field sort of winds around the wire. Let's see. So now I'm going to draw a figure to show what the quantities are. This is my charge distribution, uh, sorry, current distribution somehow floating around in space. I'm looking at this point over here. I put the origin here, but it could be outside the charge distribution, of course. <coughs> R prime is just my, <coughs> my integration, uh, sorry. Oh. R prime is just my integration variable. R is the vector pointing from the origin to the point I'm interested in. And the big R is just the difference between these two points. So I'm integrating over this R prime system, and I'm standing in the R system. And yeah. And for a line current, which is of course a very common phenomenon because of the, well, because everything runs on electricity these days. A line current could just be, uh, you can calculate the, the magnetic field from a line current just by doing the following replacement. You replace the small volume element times the uh, current density by uh, the current times a small line element. And, um, yep. and this, uh, this expression for, uh, for the magnetic field should be consistent with the fundamental equations of magnetostatics. Because this was invented before, as I said, before uh, the electrodynamic Maxwell equations. And uh, so this should be consistent and will um, I don't have so much more to say about that, so I think we'll I think we'll take a break now and start again in uh, well quarter past with an example. Okay.